Please be seated. As it looked as though the pandemic was easing in our lives and many people were breathing this sigh of relief, comedian Kate McKinnon claimed the opposite. And maybe you know of her talent on Saturday Night Live, or most recently as Weird Barbie in the Barbie movie. You know that she doesn't shy away from saying things that most of us wouldn't necessarily utter in polite company, and she plays characters that embody oftentimes the uncomfortable truths in life. As restrictions began to ease and people started talking about getting back to normal, whatever that was after the pandemic, McKinnon described the source of her melancholy as though, quote, I'm getting to the end of a tunnel, and yes, I see there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but boy, that same light shines on all of the stinky, trashy ways in which we've been living, and I get upset. She didn't name any particular evil, so you can do that, of the ways in which the pandemic exposed some things in our lives. You see, that's the way with light. It may draw us out from a despair, but not without exposing what we've hidden or ignored or denied. The same is true in the season of Epiphany. Now, Epiphany marks the final of three seasons in our faith liturgical calendar, and all three are defined by light. These three seasons coincide with the ten darkest weeks in the Northern Hemisphere. The spiritual flow begins with ever-increasing darkness. We observe Advent in the month of December, and we light candles of hope and peace and joy as the nights grow long. Near the longest night of the year, we celebrate Christmas, the light of Christ coming into our lives now and giving us the promise of light beyond the sunset of death. And after Christmas, we move into the season of Epiphany. And this is when we hear stories of Jesus. His light lures us out of hiding, but not without first spotlighting the things, the beliefs, the behaviors, the separations that have stifled us. Today's reading in this season of Epiphany comes from the Gospel of Mark. As a reminder, the Gospel of Mark tells the good news of Jesus without any birth narrative. There's no long genealogy of begats, and there is no divine oracle to anyone announcing who he is. This writer reports at Jesus' baptism, though, the heavens break apart. The Spirit descends as if a dove, and God speaks for Jesus to hear, but nobody in the crowd seems to be aware or notice. After his baptism, he goes about his ministry, but no one suspects that Jesus is anything other than an ordinary Jew wandering around in Galilee. This man of mystery calls four fishermen to follow him. And before I read about their first day in ministry, please pray with me. Dear God, we seek to know your Son and follow his ways, and we also suspect it may expose us, it may cost us, so help us. Hold us with tenderness as we hear these words, and give us courage to be fully present to you and the authority you give to him, not only today, but every day of our lives. Amen. I invite you to listen for God's living word as I read from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. They, meaning Jesus and his four fishermen, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught as one having authority and not as one of the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, 
Jesus' fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A man by the name of Nate Staniforth explores wonder, mystery, spirituality, and science, all of those lofty ideas. He has a popular TED Talk, numerous podcasts, and he's been invited to be a lecturer at Oxford University, and those are ways that pinpoint the authority that he's gained from this confluence of disciplines by what he does for a living. Staniforth appears at nightclubs. You see, he's a magician. One reporter wrote of his opening night act, I quote, I have no idea now what to believe ever again. No rabbits, no top hats, no smoke machines. Staniforth's show feels more like jumping out of an airplane. If you see his show, it's all on YouTube and some other places, the Discovery Channel. He abandons the ubiquitous style without substance bravado that so often is associated with magic. And he appeals instead to the imagination and the intellect of his audience. Staniforth says, I quote, when you're young, it's easy to be amazed. And as you get older, the experience of astonishment gets harder and harder to find. Good magic isn't about deception. It's about trying to see things. His act is wild and visceral and immediate, and like great art, it encourages us to open our hearts and minds and see the world in new ways. But it surprised me to learn that magicians provoke wide-ranging emotions. You know, I would think that you go to be entertained by tricks, and yeah, you expect to have the laws of gravity defied or maybe disturbed with our sense of what order is supposed to be with some new possibility. Yes, I expect to be unnerved, but he describes that we are both aroused with delight as well as anger. And that's what surprised me is the anger that he describes. So let me return to Staniforth's own work, writings. The anger towards the modern magician comes from the way a simple magic trick done well can reach uninvited to the deepest hopes of a person. Sometimes it can be an uncomfortable reminder that people have hard lives. And something like magic, something like magic that promises us a moment of real joy or a new way of seeing the world threatens to unseat whatever insulation they've managed to erect between themselves and the hardness, whether it's cynicism, nihilism, escapism, or elitism. The cultural resentment towards magic comes from the sadness found in the space between the universal human longing to believe in magic and the overwhelming evidence all around us that there is no such thing. And he concludes, it's not that modern audiences don't want magic. It's that they want it so badly, but have already decided that it's not out there. And they dislike being told that maybe they've been looking in the wrong place or that they should just not look at all. This passion, this passion to find the source of meaning and authority in our lives puts us right alongside all of those people in that synagogue in Capernaum 2,000 years ago. At the time, a synagogue functioned absolutely as a place of worship and study, and in the first century, it became kind of a community center. Some synagogues provided overnight rooms, and so along with becoming the seat of religious faith, the synagogue became a gathering place, kind of like, in my mind, an English pub. So imagine Jesus walks in with his four fisher friends, and he starts to teach. This stranger Jesus comes without the refined credentials of the scribe, the one who normally holds court. Jesus doesn't have a diploma to hang on the wall or the equivalent of some PowerPoint presentations to argue his interpretations. No one knows what to make of this man. But Mark tells us he takes ancient scrolls and he reads the words that they've heard throughout their lives, only he does so with a new authority. Mark tells us he doesn't teach like the scribes. So that then prompts the questions, 
How did the scribes teach? We don't know. But in this silence, we can imagine that perhaps their teaching is marked by sameness or dullness or resignation. It's controlled, it's predictable, because we do the same thing over and over again. You have to wonder, did the scribes humble themselves in prayer before reading? Do they expect to be startled with the truth? And perhaps the people listen to them with that same sense of, I have heard this before. We don't know. But whatever the case, it's clear that Jesus is different. And what distinguishes him is the authority that he expresses. And that Greek word for authority could also be translated as power. And hearkening back to that power just sentences ago that descended upon him like a dove with the Holy Spirit. Jesus' teaching creates space for people to wonder of new potentials other than what's always been dictated to them with rules and laws and commandments and the same old, same old. Jesus' authority also shines a light on the demons that possess one of the men. It's a jarring scene. The verbs are jarring. We need to know that this is quite upsetting. An unnamed man with an unclean spirit is the first one to speak. And the possessed man speaks of himself in the first person plural, us. It only amplifies the cry to say, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? And then we see that the man seems to recognize Jesus' purpose of bringing God's realm to earth. You see, his demons, his demons understand that Jesus' power and authority is far greater than any authority they might have had on this man's life. They see him. They see him as the Holy One of God. For this, Scripture tells us Jesus censors and literally muzzles, literally muzzles them. This we of the demonic host obeys, but not without convulsions and cries commensurate with this struggle that appears. Now let's not push aside this story as a primitive understanding of demons or some far-fetched fable without impact on us today. Let's not let our sophistication cloud us. In fact, when I read stories like this, I try to imagine casting it as a screenplay. What actor would we put in the role of Jesus? He is mysterious, completely so far. But what man would we put in this un man with an unclean spirit to make him not just a two-dimensional, nameless person? And I couldn't. And I finally decided that the case of this man possessed by demons rather than one man is every man. He is every single one of us. He is all of us who are possessed by not one demon, but the demonic life-threatening pressures that suck the life out of each of us, such as loneliness or overwork or apathy. Maybe someone's demon gnaws at them with financial insecurity or bludgeons them every day with addiction. This epiphany story spotlights Jesus' authority with scripture and humanity. The story reveals the strength of God's word to us and Jesus' saving grace. You know, too frequently we water down scripture's truth. You know, there were those terrible exiles, but that was a long time ago. Well, there was a reason those exiles happened. We water down scripture's honest call for justice and mercy. We water it down and make it irrelevant. Too frequently, we live with lumpy rugs because we've swept things under them, or we ignore the dead elephants for fear that we might expose anxiety or depression or insecurities or any of those other crushing feelings that keep us from being alive. Too frequently, we think of Jesus and the church as a social gathering or a community in which to show up, we've got to put on that mask that says, I'm just fine, when actually what we want to do is scream for help. Jesus doesn't bring some nightclub routine with illusions or sleights of hand. His ministry begins not with a trick, but by seeing, but by seeing and liberating one person at a time. The crowd responds by being amazed. 
Maybe some were angry, but we can imagine a lot of them were delighted. Being amazed is that experience that proves that things don't need to be the way they are. Being amazed means that healing and transformation and justice can happen here and now. And giving in to astonishment means that there is more at work in the world than what we had previously been able to see. Yes, when we see his amazing power, we also get to see those nasty bits in our life. But we know that his power is greater than any of those things, and we can leave them behind. When we're honest, we can name our own unclean spirit, and then the light of epiphany draws us forward. And isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we want? Not, not magic or even real magic. We want to be close to God. And we decide that we're going to drop what we're doing and we're going to follow him. That's the kind of life he brings. Life. May it be so, my friends.